Hello and welcome to the True Crime and Mystery Lounge. Today we're going to talk about Charles Whitman. He's known as the Texas Tower Sniper. He's also regarded as the grandfather of American school shooters. When you think of school shootings, normally you would think of Columbine or Virginia Tech and even some of the most recent events. But everything has an origin to it, so we will look at how this horrible event came to be. Charles Joseph Whitman was born June 24, 1941, in Lake Worth, Florida, to Charles A. Whitman, Jr. and Margaret Whitman, the oldest of three sons. Charlie's father was raised as an orphan in Savannah, Georgia, and, and described himself as a self-made man. He pulled himself out of poverty through determination and hard work alone. He's a self-employed plumbing contractor. He married Margaret, who was 17 at the time, and it wasn't long after when she got pregnant with Charlie. They settled down in the suburbs of Lake Worth. Charles Sr. ran a tight ship in his house. Everything had to be perfect. And if anyone made a mistake, well, it would be dealt with with violence. Margaret wasn't spared from this kind of treatment. She was basically the main punching bag for any of his frustrations. But to everyone in the neighborhood, the Whitmans were the perfect family. They had no idea what was going on behind closed doors. They had the biggest house, and Margaret wore the latest fashion at the time. Charles left most of the child rearing to his wife as a strong believer in traditional family roles. But it never bothered Margaret. Soon, Patrick and John were born years after Charlie. Charlie was a polite boy and running around his neighborhood all day, filling those who saw him with delight at his antics. He didn't have a mean bone in his body. He was very courteous with the neighbors. Since he was too young to play outside on his own, all the neighbors would keep a, a watchful eye on him. Charles took Charlie out for target shooting as soon as he was old enough and found out that the boy was a natural shot, so they would go out on regular hunting trips whenever possible. It was the only father-son bonding time they would have. He learned how to play piano at a very young age as well. Before Charlie started school, he was administered an IQ test. He tested out at 139. He was in the top percentile of intelligence, a genius. He excelled in school and kept himself busy with all sorts of activities. Activities. He was a star pitcher on his baseball team. He played football, and at age 12, he became the youngest Eagle Scout in history. He was even an altar boy at Sacred Heart Roman Catholic Church every Sunday. Later, he got a newspaper route. Whenever it was raining or cold out, his mother would drive Charlie around his route. It was the only time the two of them got together without a list of tasks to complete, and was the only time Charlie and his mother could talk without anyone listening in. He learned for the first time what real parental love is. It's not an endless struggle for approval or that every disagreement ended with physical pain and fury. Real parental love was actual and unconditional. Having this revelation about his father's behavior, realizing that this is not normal, now that he learned about love, he began to learn about hate. All the hatred and anger Charlie felt for his father was redirected towards his sharpshooting skills. He became so good that he could shoot the eye out of a squirrel by the time he was 16. He bought a motorcycle with his paper route money. In high school, Charlie was popular and well-liked by his peers, and lots of girls wanted to date him. Graduation time was rolling around, and with that came lots of parties. One night, he came home from a party with the football team, drunk as a skunk. He was an hour past his curfew. Charlie thought thought his dad would be asleep by this time, so he tried to creep through the backyard and enter through the kitchen door. When he spotted his father sitting by the side of the pool on a deck chair, staring up at the stars, he smelled the beer on his son's breath and seeing the sway in his step. He began to punch Charlie, beating so bad that he blacked out after the first few punches. Once he was on his knees, he thought it would be over, but no. His father started kicking him in the rib, knocking what air he had left in his lungs. With a nasty sneer on his face, he kicked him one good time that Charlie fell into the pool. He sank to the bottom, almost drowning. But while drifting in and out of consciousness, he felt something cold and metal bump him. It was the metal pool ladder. He pulled himself up and out of the pool, coughing up a lung full of water. Once he gained awareness of his surroundings, expecting his father to still be there, nope, that wasn't the case. His father had walked back into the house, not caring whether his son was going to drown. The old man thought he finally knocked some sense into his eldest child and that his household was going to run smoothly from now on. It did until one day Charles came home to 
find Charlie was gone. What old man Whitman didn't know was that Charlie had enlisted in the United States Marine Corps one month after his graduation from high school in June 1969, where he graduated seventh in a class of 72 students. On July 6, 1959, with all of his papers signed and filed, Charlie took the train to the recruitment depot at Paris Island. The moment Charles found out, he started calling his network of contacts until he got an executive power in the federal government. He tried to convince them that Charlie was an unsuitable recruit because of his behavior at home and that his enlistment has to be canceled. But for the first time in Charles's life, he had encountered an entity that he couldn't bully and lambast into compliance. They had Charlie's signature and there was no turning back unless the boy had discharged his duty to his country. He had traded one dictator for another. The only difference was that the U.S. Marine Corps gave a damn. Once he arrived, they protected him and sheltered him from the man he was trying to run from. Training for Charlie was a breeze compared to the life he had left behind. Exercise, having to get up early, keeping his bunk and issue gear clean and orderly. It was like Charlie was on vacation. He excelled at every aspect of training. They sent him to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, where he took a marksmanship course. He scored 215 out of 250. It was enough to give him the title of sharpshooter. He wanted to advance his career more, so he wanted to go into the officer's training. He would need to apply for a scholarship to the Naval Enlistment Science and Education Program, an initiative designed to send enlisted personnel to college to train as, as engineers, and after graduation, be commissioned as officers. Charlie earned high scores on the required examination, and the selection committee approved his enrollment at a preparatory school in Maryland, where he completed courses in math mathematics and physics before being approved to transfer to the University of Texas at Austin to study mechanical engineering. College life was like a whole new world for him. There was music playing that he had never heard before, more styles and genres that he never knew existed. It was more relaxed and no one was barking orders at him. This is what he was craving and he ate up every bit of it. There were buildings, swimming pools, football fields, baseball fields. There were more than 50,000 students and faculty spread out on this 40 acre campus. His classes were engaging and his peers were fun and his life for the very first time was his own, like a kid in a candy store. The one thing that caught his eye the most was on his first day on campus in September 1961 when he saw the 307 foot gothic Victorian style tower of the main building and gawked at it. He got into hunting with a group of friends but when they were caught poaching a deer and tried to clean it and skin it in the shower at Charlie's dormitory they were arrested and fined $100. He also took up karate, scooping diving and gambling. He became a known prankster, but his friends also noted he made some morbid and chilling statements. A person could stand off in an army atop of that clock tower before they got him. In February 1962, Charlie met Kathleen Leisner, who was a trainee school teacher and a couple of years younger than him. She had brown hair and green eyes and a soft smile that made him melt. She was what people would describe as the girl next door. It was love at first sight and also Charlie's first series relationship. It wasn't long before Charlie met Kathy's father and liked him right away. Her father was impressed with his seriousness about Kathy and his career. On August 17, 1962, Charlie and Kathy were married. The wedding was held in Kathy's hometown of Needsville, Texas. Lots of family and friends showed up. Even Charlie's younger brother, Patrick, was the best man. But even though the wedding went off perfectly, Charlie couldn't help but notice that his mother didn't look well. She lost weight and was always on the verge of flinching. No one else saw it, but he did, and it broke his heart. The Whitmans left early after the wedding. Back at school, they moved out of the dorms and got an apartment off campus. Things were looking good until Charlie's grades began to slip. He was maintaining a B average only because he was working twice as hard. But then they slipped so far that the Marines noticed. He was ordered to active duty in February 1963 and went to Camp Lejeune in North Carolina for the remainder of his five-year enlistment. 
Charlie returned to the Marine Corps in disgrace, his promising career as an officer forgotten, and his will to excel broken. Cuba was an old, fond memory to him, but life on Camp Lejeune in North Carolina was a very different experience. The routine that had once been a comfort was now like a forced march with a heavy pack. He missed his wife and his college life. He struggled to even be average, everything reminding him of his father, but upon his arrival back, he was promoted to the rank of Lance Corporal. One day while on patrol in a jeep, the Marine who was driving misjudged a corner and went over the edge of a ditch, flipping their vehicle. Both men were injured in the crash. Both were bleeding, bruised, and had a few broken bones apiece. Charlie somehow got the strength to rescue the driver, freeing him from under the jeep in which he was pinned. They were both hospitalized for four days. The only real escape from life on base was gambling. He would occasionally loan money out to his fellow marines but expected it back in a timely manner. One particular guy owed him $30 for over a month and every attempt fell on deaf ears. So finally Charlie had enough and confronted the guy with a flash of his pistol tucked under his belt and he would charge him $15 interest in the loan. Well that guy went and told on him for the gun that was smuggled in. He was court-martialed in November 1963 for gambling, usury, possession of a personal firearm on base. While he was confined and awaiting trial, he had little to do to fill his time. He began keeping a journal of his thoughts that were titled The Daily Records of C.J. Whitman. Page after page of this book was filled with praise of his wife, Kathy. The rest of it was occupied with a recounting of daily actions and seemingly more and more contempt that he held for the Marine Corps, preying on young men when they are at their most vulnerable, and treating them like he'd been treated. He was starting to grow a distaste for authority. At trial, he pled not guilty for making threats, but was found guilty. He even admitted to possessing an unauthorized pistol and admitted to lending out money with interest on no less than 10 occasions. He was sentenced to 30 days of confinement and 90 days of hard labor. He was demoted from Lance Corporal to private, and by the later half of 1964, he received his honorable discharge. He took the first train back to Texas. Charlie slipped back into college life with ease and switched his major from mechanical engineering to architectural engineering. His wife waited patiently for him to come home, but while he was gone, she became a substitute teacher and eventually got a full-time teaching position at Lanier High School teaching biology. They rented a cottage with a lovely pecan tree out front, but now that he was out of the Marines, Charlie had to pay for tuition and books himself. So he took on a series of jobs, first as a bill collector for the Standard Finance Company, then worked as a bank teller at Austin National Bank. Later, he took on a temporary job with Central Freight Lines as a traffic surveyor for the Texas Department highway department. During the summer, Kathy took a job as a telephone operator at Southwestern Bell Telephone. He also volunteered with the scouts as well. So once again, they both had a pretty tight schedule and an even smaller budget. They struggled to make ends meet, so he called upon the one person he hated to ask for money from, his father. When he called him, Charles was more than happy to cover Charlie's school expenses to his surprise. But at the same time, this call sparked communication with his mother more. They would talk on the phone from time to time, but because they feared their conversation would be overheard, Charlie switched to writing his mother letter. Until one day in February 1966, the phone rang. Charlie's mother called to ask him to come get her. She wanted out of the marriage and needed to get away quickly, so he dropped everything and drove down to Lake Worth from Austin. Normally it takes about two days to get there, but Charlie managed to get there in a little over a day. He stopped by a payphone and called the local sheriff asking for them to have someone outside the Whitman residence while Margaret packed. He managed to get his mom out of there while his father was, wasn't at home and they drove like a bat out of hell to get away from there. Once back in Austin, she stayed with the couple for a day or so. Then Charlie managed to get her a job at a cafeteria and got her an apartment not far from him. But she didn't know that he was 
paying half of the rent for her. Soon the phone started ringing non-stop, day and night. Charlie stared at the phone, knowing exactly who it was, and he would pick it up anyways. It was Charles, begging and pleading to know where his wife is and wants her to come back home to him. But Charlie never gave out her location at all. His mother is safe, and he's going to keep it that way. But things were starting to change in Charlie. He started getting more tension headaches. He was always exhausted, not able to eat or sleep properly, and it was taking a toll on him. So he went to the campus doctor and he was prescribed dexedrine, an amphetamine. Now he felt like with a sudden burst of energy he could do anything. One day a friend of his came by to check on Charlie and found him in a very bad state. He found him with a suitcase full of clothes and wanted to run away and become homeless. His his friend managed to sit him down and, and calmly talk him out of it and put everything back. It was clear that the medication he was given put Charlie in a manic state. At some point in another manic state, he hit his wife. Realizing what he had done, he broke down in tears. He didn't want to become like his father, but here he was, doing this one thing he swore he would never do after seeing what happened to his mother. He promised her that he would treat her better. She stuck by him. So to keep himself on the right path, he would write notes to himself on a daily basis, reminding himself to be patient and gentle with his wife. But then he would write more and more and more until he wrote notes down on any spare scrap of paper. He developed a new disorder, hypergraphia or graphomania. It's an obsessive, uncontrollable impulse to write. He finally went back to the campus doctor and he was prescribed Valium to bring his stress level down. So here he was taking dexamethasone dream during the day and Valium at night. But he was also prescribed one more thing. Talk to a psychiatrist. Even though he wasn't a big fan of psychiatry, he went anyway. He talked with Dr. Maurice Heatley for two hours, but he didn't prescribe him anything. His daily life continued. Taking medication he was given only made things worse and worse. But every time he was going to class, he kept staring at that clock tower. A plan was already cooking in his brain. Charlie began to form a plan, a solution to all of his problems. He just had to prepare for it. During his planning, a wave of calm came over him. It's as if he changed to a totally relaxed and pleasant person. He began to pick up and drop off his wife at work, and his mother received extra attention picking her up from work to go to the movies. But after dropping his wife off at work on July 31st and did some shopping, he bought a new hunting knife and some tins of spam. Afterwards, he picked up his mother from work and took her to the movies. Once he dropped her off, he went home at, and at 6.45 p.m. he began to type. I don't quite understand what compels me to type this letter. Perhaps it is to leave some vague reason for the actions I have recently performed. I don't really understand myself these days. I'm supposed to be an average, reasonable, and intelligent young man. However, lately, I can't recall when it started. I have been a victim of many unusual and irrational thoughts. These thoughts constantly recur, and it takes a tremendous mental effort to concentrate on useful, or progressive task. He barely started to write his confession when there was a knock on the door and his friend Larry and his wife dropped in for a chat. They paused at the entrance to the kitchen when they saw that Charlie was working and asked what he was writing. He said just some letters to old friends as he covered up what he was writing. After a brief chat they left and he continued to type. In March, when my parents made a physical break, I noticed a great deal of stress. I consulted with a doctor and asked him to recommend someone that I can consult about some psychiatric disorder I felt I had. I talked with a doctor once for about two hours and tried to convey to him my fears that I felt some overwhelming violent impulses. After one session, I never saw that doctor again, and since then, I have been fighting my mental turmoil alone and seemingly 
to no avail. After my death, I wish that an autopsy would be performed on me to see if, if there is any visible physical disorder. I have had some tremendous headaches in the past and consumed two large bottles of Excedrin in the past three months. It was after much thought that I decided to kill my wife, Kathy, tonight after I pick her up from work at the telephone company. I love her dearly and she has been a fine wife to me as any man could ever hope to have. I cannot rationally pinpoint any specific reason for doing this. I don't know whether it's selfishness or if I don't want her to face the embarrassment that my actions would surely cause her. At this time though, the prominent reason in my mind is that I truly do not consider this world worth living in and am prepared to die and do not want to leave her to suffer alone in it. I intend to kill her as painless as possible. With his suicide letter almost done, it was 8.45 p.m. Time to pick up Kathy. He picks her up and after a full day of work, she's exhausted. Yet even as tired as she was, her face lit up when she saw Charlie pull up. She hopped in and they headed home. He helped her out of her clothes and into bed, tucking her in. Giving her a gentle kiss on her forehead, he then left and headed to his mother's apartment. He woke her up out of a sound sleep. It was midnight. He hardly said a word as she let him in. He then attacked her. When she brought up her arms to block a hit, she knew was coming, he broke her fingers in one punch, then took the hunting knife and plunged it straight into her chest. As she was laying on the floor, she didn't die instantly, so he shot her once in the back of the head. Charlie then gently picked up his mother and laid her on the bed and pulled the covers over her chest. He then went to the bathroom to clean himself up. It was half past midnight on August 1st when he sat down in his mother's living room and wrote this note. To whom it may concern, I have taken my mother life. I am very upset about having done it. However, I feel that if there is a heaven, then she is definitely there now. And if there is not a life after, I have relieved her of her suffering here on earth. The intense hatred I feel for my father is beyond description. My mother gave that man the 25 best years of her life, and she finally took enough of his beatings, humiliation, degradation, and tribulation that I am sure that nobody but she and he will ever know. He has chose to treat her like a slut that you would bed down with, accept her favors, then throw her penance in return. I am truly sorry that this is the only way I could see to relieve her suffering, but I think it was the best. Let there be no doubt in your mind that I love that woman with all my heart. If there exists a God, let him understand my actions and judge me accordingly. He placed a note on his mother and went home. Once home, he crept quietly to where Kathy was sleeping, not making a sound. He pulled back the sheet ever so gently, looking at her one last time. He then plunged the knife into her chest as hard as he could. Her final breath exploded out from between her lips, but her eyes never opened. He pulled out the knife, cleaned it again, then took a shower. Once clean, he picked up where he left off on his suicide letter. Similar reasons provoked me to take my mother's life also. I don't think the poor woman ever enjoyed life, as she's entitled to. She was a simple simple young woman who married a possessive and dominating man. All my life until I ran away from home to join the Marine Corps, the ink ribbon gave out. He ripped the paper out from the typewriter and got a pen and continued. I was a witness to her being beaten at least once a month. Then when she took enough, my father wanted to fight to keep her below her usual standard of living. I imagine it appears that I brutally killed both of my loved ones. I am only trying to do a quick and thorough job. If my life insurance policy is valid, please see that all the worthless checks I wrote this weekend are made good. Please pay off all my debts. I am 25 years old and have never been financially independent. Donate the rest anonymously to a mental health foundation. Maybe research can prevent further tragedies of this type. Give our dog to my in-laws. Tell them that Kathy loves Scozy very much. R. W. Leisner, Needville, Texas. He signed it with his name. After writing letters to his brothers, he called at 545 to Kathy's supervisor at work to inform him that she is unwell and wouldn't be into work today. He then started packing up his supplies. Sandwiches, an extension cord, a flashlight, spare batteries, a roll of tape, an ammunition box, a gun 
cleaning kit, transistor radio, a blank notebook and pens, a towel, a white sweatband, a three gallon jug of water, three gallon jug of gasoline, ropes and clothesline, a compass, an alarm clock, a pipe wrench, spare clothes and sunglasses. Anything he thought might be useful. He then put all of these items into an old trunk. He went out for his last bit of shopping. He got a dolly to help transport the trunk, rebar, a machete, and pocket knife. He got four rifles with scopes and two other handguns and a whole lot of ammo. He got back home, packed up everything, and before leaving, he called his mother's work to say that she's unwell and won't be coming in for work. He got to the campus and was waved through security because he's a student. He made his way to the tower at 11.30 a.m. It's August 1st and it's brutally hot out and not a cloud in the sky as he made his way up to the elevator and onto the 27th floor. He then took the stairs to the observation deck on the 28th floor. There he encountered reception Edna Townsley. Charlie knocked Townsley on the floor and split the back of her skull with his rifle butt and then struck her above the left eye before dragging her behind a couch. He then made a barricade at the top of the steps. Michael and Mary Gabor with their sons Mike and Mark and were in Austin visiting Michael's sister Marguerite Lamport and her husband William. Around 11.45 they were climbing the stairs from the 27th floor when they encountered the desk Charlie had placed at the entrance to the reception area. As Mike and Mark squeezed past, he came forward and fired his shotgun, killing Mark and hitting Mike in the shoulder. He shot again down the stairs, striking Marguerite and Mary. He then set up all of his supplies at all four points so it would appear as if there were more than one shooter. He looked through his scope at 18-year-old Claire Wilson and her boyfriend Thomas Ekman. Claire was eight months pregnant. He fired a shot into Claire's abdomen, then another shot rang out, killing her boyfriend. Robert Boyer was a mathematic professor who had a teaching job lined up for him in Liverpool, England, and his wife and children were waiting for him there when he was shot and killed just outside the lecture hall. Thomas Ashton was mortally wounded in the chest. Karen Griffin, a high school student, was shot in the shoulder and chest, and her right lung was pierced. She died several days later. Thomas Carr, who came to Karen's aid was also shot and died approximately one hour later. Everyone was in a state of confusion. This had never happened before. As police showed up to the scene, there were also targets for the shooter as well. Patrolman Billy Speed and another officer were hiding behind decorative bolsters on the South Mall when he was shot through a gap in the masonry. He died soon after at the hospital. People were trying to help the wounded any way they could, but they had to be careful as to not get shot. Even the helicopter that flew too close wasn't safe. Charlie shot at it before it flew away. News reporters on the radio and television were covering this event live and because he had a radio, Charlie knew exactly what was going on. Someone needed to come up with a plan to stop him once and for all. Charlie's plan of attack worked out well, but now he began to face opposition. Police and locals turned up with their guns, firing back at him, trying to get a hit. Charlie was pinned down. Little did he know that police were gathering up a small team to put a stop to all this madness. Officer Houston McCoy, Officer Ray Martinez, and Officer Jerry Day, and Alan Crum, who is a retired Air Force tail gunner, decided on their own to go up to face the sniper. They didn't know how many people they were dealing with. They deputized Alan Crum because he was bound and determined to get this guy. As they carefully made their way to the 27th floor, they noticed the carnage that had already happened. Officer Day went to get help for the wounded. Martinez, McCoy, and Crum made their way past the barricade. The two officers told Crum to stay on the southwest corner of the observation deck and fire at anything that comes his way. They went the opposite direction, carefully checking each corner. They heard Crum misfire his rifle, which was the perfect distraction for the sniper who was sitting on the south side of the deck. Both officers sprang into action and opened fire on Charlie, hitting him twice in the face and chest. McCoy stared in horror as Charlie's arms continued to move despite being shot in the skull, but somehow with a dozen bullet holes in him, he kept trying to move. 
Martinez grabbed McCoy's rifle and at point-blank range shot Charlie right in the face. No one on that deck had ever heard a death rattle before, but the sound of the air escaping from his lungs as he slumped lifelessly to the ground was more like a sigh of relief than anything else. They checked him for a pulse, nothing. But the gunfire hasn't stopped below. They don't know what had just happened. Crumb knew what to do. He took Charlie's towel and waved it like a flag. After 96 minutes of terror, with 16 dead and 31 wounded, the battle was over. The gunman was dead. It was 1.24 p.m. Now that Charlie was dead, everyone wanted to know why did he do it. An autopsy was performed on him with the permission of his father. They found a brain tumor the size of a walnut. It was glioblastoma multiforma with widespread areas of necrosis, a very malignant tumor. It was pressing on his amygdala, a part of the brain related to anxiety and fight or flight responses. It can also explain why he had headache, hypergraphia, and loss of impulse control. The necrosis around the tumor means that it might have been a result of a brain injury, possibly when he was beaten by his father or when he had that accident in the Marines. They also found dexedrine in his bloodstream and small amounts of Valium as well, but ultimately no one wanted to blame this solely on the fact that he had a brain tumor and that's what caused the massacre to happen. Charlie and his mother were laid to rest in Florida's Hillcrest Memorial Park. Since he was a military veteran, Charlie was buried with military honors. His casket was draped with an American flag. There was no mention of his wife's funeral. Claire Wilson was taken to the hospital where she gave birth to the remains of her child. Despite extensive surgery, her uterus couldn't be repaired and she was rendered infertile. After her recovery, she lived a different life. She joined a commune of Seventh-day Adventists. She took care of the children there, acting as a teacher. She left the commune and always surrounded herself with children, becoming a foster mother and even adopting a boy from Ethiopia. Mike Gabor couldn't continue in the Air Force because of his injury. He devotes his time to caring for his mother Mary, who had been paralyzed from the neck down and blinded by the shotgun blast. Following the shootings, the tower observation deck was closed. The various bullet holes were repaired and the tower was reopened in 1968. It was closed again in 1975 following four suicides. There was no police present at the time. After the shooting, there was a widespread acknowledgement that security measures in place were inadequate to address campus-wide issues on this scale. As a result of the outcry following the shooting, progress towards cohesive campus police force began shortly after. In 2006, a memorial garden was dedicated to those who died or were otherwise affected. A monument listing the names of the victims was added in 2016 on the shooting's 50th anniversary. The tower's clock was stopped for 24 hours beginning at 11 48 a.m. The day was declared by the city of Austin as Ramiro Martinez Day. This school shooting is one of those that is just heartbreaking. I mean, all shootings are. But this one struck out to me. I wanted to know how this all came to be. This horrific norm of school shooting, as we know it, to be all too common. I know there was the bad school bombing, but that is a whole nother category of horror. And of all things that could cause this guy to do what he did was a brain tumor. Something nowadays you could spot on a CT or an MRI scan. Hell, I'm sure a simple x-ray you could have seen it plain as day but no one wanted to blame it on the tumor i'm pretty sure if he didn't have that brain tumor he wouldn't have displayed the behaviors he was exhibiting now he would have probably experienced burnout from all the activities and work now if you're one of those morbidly curious types yes there are pictures of what whitman looked like when he was shot dead and his wife and his mother's bodies i was not going to show that on here because i would be flat 
flagged every way to Sunday, and I don't need that. So if you're curious, look it up on Google. It's there. But I do have a book recommendation that dives deeper into this case. It's called The Texas Tower Sniper by Ryan Green. It's jam-packed with info, and the whole book is about 150 pages. It's a short read, but nothing short of fascinating. So what did you think of this case? If you made it this far into the video, thank you. And if you enjoyed this video, please smash the like button and don't forget to subscribe and tickle that little bell icon so you don't miss the next episode. You never know who I will cover next. Thank you for hanging out with me in the True Crime and Mystery Lounge. This is Phoenix signing out. Have a good evening and stay safe.